Hello, everybody. My name is Axel Jans. I'm head of global e-business at Eppendorf, and I have been responsible for the Eppendorf and Science Prize for Neurobiology since its inception 19 years ago, or actually a little longer. I would like to welcome you all to the first virtual ceremony of our prize. I'm your host for this event, and I will guide you through the program. And you all know, normally, we would have taken um, a different approach, and our event would have taken place two days ago in Washington, D.C., at the headquarters of AAAS in Science. And um, yeah, through COVID-19, this situation of the pandemic does not allow us to celebrate the prize in its usual way. So we found a new way. Um, and we, we feel it's very important to do so because um, it is important to recognize top young researchers, especially, I think, in times of the pandemic. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks for joining us in this virtual prize ceremony 2020. Um, as I said, my name is Eva von Pelt. I'm the co-CEO, Chief Commercial Officer at Eppendorf in Hamburg. And I'm also very proud because I'm the patron of the Eppendorf in Science Prize for Neurobiology. And that means I take a very special interest in seeing the prize grow from year to year and also meeting our new winners and finalists. I would like to congratulate you, Chris, Tara and Ricardo, on your fantastic achievement. On a personal note, it's also good to see another female awardee this year and also to see an international awardee with his roots in Italy. And I look forward to hearing from you in a few minutes. Since 2002, we have partnered with the prestigious journal Science to create what the prize has become today, one of the leading prizes for young neurobiologists. This year, the prize is being awarded for the 19th time, and this is a tremendous legacy. We have had some wonderful past and present winners who all have one thing in common. They're very passionate about, passionate about the work. This prize is very dear and is very important to Eppendorf. This is at the heart of what Eppendorf stands for. This year, Eppendorf is celebrating 75 years of supporting science and researchers. Back in 1945, our founders, Heinrich Neteler and Hans Hinz, had a vision to help improve human living conditions. And this vision continues to live in us, in our hearts, everyone at Eppendorf, and also lives in the Eppendorf and Science Prize for Neurobiology. I'm Peter Stern. I'm the neuroscience editor at Science Magazine. And I was also the chairman of the selection committee this year. Um, as you may remember from what I've told people in the past, there are two components to being successful in science, in the, in the world of science in general. There is good science, good research, but that's not enough. The other part is you also have to communicate what you have done. And with this prize, we are trying to honor when people achieve exactly these two components. I want to mention someone who has done really good science, so the scientific quality must be high, but also this communication part. You want to talk to others. You want to explain why you are excited about your work. And we try to read the essay and try to see did this person somehow communicate the enthusiasm? Why did they spend so much time in the lab working hard? What was the motivation behind it? And I think this year we have again picked the winners. We've done a really good job to bring this feeling of working hard for the greater good across. Um, I want to mention our two finalists first. Let's start with Tara Legates. And now she has already reached the stage of being an assistant professor at University of Maryland. And um, the title of her essay was The Reward Integrator. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Our second finalist was Ricardo Beltramo. And the title of his essay is 
a new primary visual cortex. Now let's come to our overall winner this year, Christopher Zimmerman. In the meantime, Christopher has moved back to the East Coast and he is a postdoctoral fellow at the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. And the title of his essay is The Origins of Thirst. When I read these titles, I thought already, aren't they interesting? The moment you read this, you want to know more about it. And you're immediately drawn in and then you start reading the essays. I think it is already, the titles show that this is something that is of broader interest for everyone. Tara, you already received the plaque that is part of, you know, the prize. Normally we would have handed it out on stage, but now you have um, already gotten it by post, I guess, by mail. Can you show it to the camera? <laughs> Great. <laughs> now to our second runner up, Ricardo, you already uh, received the plaque too, I guess. Can you show that to us? You have it with you? All right, now it's official. <laughs> and now to our grand prize winner, Christopher Zimmerman. Um, Chris also received his trophy prior to this event. Can you hold that into the camera, Chris? Also now it's official, <laughs> congratulations. Um, the research I described in my essay addresses a simple question. Where does our sense of thirst come from? But it has a crucial shortcoming, which is that drinking behavior, what thirst ultimately controls, is regulated on a really fast moment-by-moment -moment basis that we can't explain with these slow changes in the osmolarity of the blood. Um, to give you just one example, when we are really thirsty and we drink water, that immediately quenches our feelings of thirst, even though that water won't be absorbed into our bloodstream for many minutes. Um, so what's missing from this model? How does the brain bridge these different time scales, the blood and the behavior, to control our sense of thirst in real time? I reason that we might be able to answer this question by watching the activity of the brain's thirst-promoting neurons in a living animal. And so to do this, working with colleagues at UCSF and Zachary Knight's lab, I use genetic tools to label and target these osmosensor neurons for the first time, and then to record and manipulate their activity in awake behaving mice. And these experiments first confirmed that these cells, as we would expect, do detect dehydration signals like blood osmolarity consistent with the classical osmosensor model. Um, however, it was really surprising to find that these cells also receive a second class of signals that operate on the fast time scale of our behavior. And this new class of signals doesn't arise exclusively from blood sensing in our brains, but from throughout the body, including from the mouth and throat and gut. And so for example, during drinking, every time a mouse takes a lick of water, the mouth and throat tell the brain the volume of fluid that the mouse has drunk. And then a signal from the gut comes in a few moments later to say what the mouse has consumed, whether it's water or salty. And similarly, during eating, another set of signals tells these thirst neurons how much food we've eaten in a way that can drive prandial thirst during meals. Um, and this is really exciting because it says that altogether, these signals from the body to the brain tell the thirst system about the volume and composition of the fluids we drink and the amount of food we're eating in real time in a way that allows this system to predict changes in hydration before they occur and adjust our level of thirst preemptively. I would slowly come to an end of our virtual ceremony. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for viewing. Thank you for the audience to join us. Um, my name is Axel Jans, and thank you for listening and watching. Thank you.